All right. So today we're going to consider again and continue and just complete that opening passage of Romans 1. As we saw last week, it is rich with a plan of God for your life. Knowing that we have, and here's our three areas, we have an identity, a call, and a purpose that it will allow us to live in contentment and fulfillment in our lives. That's kind of what we said last week in a nutshell. Do you remember? And so we're going to continue. We're going to read and we're going to get straight into it from Romans chapter 1, verse 1 to 7. And before we just sort of read through this passage, and it's going to be up there, which is great, fantastic. Um, I just want to say, I'm going to stop. And I want to just, interesting, the, the change of tone where Paul goes after the first six verses. Quite interesting. Okay, let's, let's just watch out for it. Romans 1, verse 1 to 7, and it's the uh, ESV version. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart from the gospel of God, for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared, declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name, among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Now, although we read the whole passage last week, it's interesting, Paul is introducing himself, and that's really what we focused on those first six verses. Look at the change in his tone in this week's uh, verse. To all, so he's not talking about himself now, he says, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so you see there's a difference. He's gone from himself where he's at, his introduction of who he is, he's called, he's got an identity and he's got a purpose in Christ. And remember, we finished off by saying, as I said earlier on, that, you know, all heaven is on your side. All of heaven is on your side. Now, that deserves a great and one big almighty amen. Come on, church. All of heaven is on your side. In every moment of every circumstance of your day, all of heaven is is on your side for you to succeed, for you to fulfill the will and call of God over your life. Amen? Amen. Good stuff. Okay. So we're on the same page tonight. I want to read our scripture again. Just listen to this. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now keep that verse in mind. At the end of this introduction, Paul, what he does, he changes direction from where he was last week in that message we, we looked at. Paul doesn't identify them as, Roman, as Romans. In fact, he identifies them to all who are in Rome. Okay, it might seem like a little bit of a picky, bit of a picky sort of um, uh, way of putting this. But he's not saying to all the Romans. He's saying to all those in Rome. It's the difference between writing a letter to Cornwall and saying to all those in Cornwall rather than, and opposed to, to all the Cornish. You see what I'm saying? So Paul is saying, okay, to all those in Rome. So... It would make sense to do it this way as Rome, think about it, was the, the centre of the, the known world at the time. Everything went through Rome and came from Rome. It was a cosmopolitan place. Martin Luther once noted that God's love precedes his call, which is going back to what we're going to look at this week. God does not demand that humanity do certain things to earn his love. Rather, he loves humanity and enables it to do things according to his will. Yeah? You see, God loves you, all right, no matter who you try and be. 
No matter who you would like to be, no matter who you are on your worst day and your best day, or anyone else in between, God loves you. Let's read our passage again. To all those in Rome who are loved by God. That's quite an interest. I didn't expect that when I read it. I didn't expect that because Paul is often quite to the point about what they're getting up to and where they need to change their lives and how they need to deal with this and how they need to sort that out. But he doesn't. He says, to everybody in Rome, God loves you. I want to say to you tonight, church, to everyone in Clay's Community Church, God loves you. Are you with me? You see, you can chuck whatever theology you want at me tonight, I'm going to say God loves you. You can be right, you can be wrong. You can have the best day ever, and I'm going to say God loves you. Are you with me? Isn't that quite an incredible uh, sort of just way that this has just come about? I just, I just quite, I'm quite intrigued by it. You can have all of God's love in your side. You have all God's love in your side. You can have all the credentials. I think about Paul, how he started this, and he says, I am this, I've got that, and I've got identity, and I've got the next thing, and I've got that. But the only one credential that you and I ever need in this life is to know the love of God in your life. Because it's because of the love of God in your life and through Jesus Christ dying on a cross that you are who you are. Not true. All right, okay. You seem really convinced, but we'll get there. According to the scripture, if you look at the Greek, the word for love is agapetos. Now, we all know the word agape, don't we? Which means brotherly and sisterly love. So derision, derision of this, okay, is agapetos. It means this, beloved, dear, or worthy of love. So what Paul is saying, he is saying this, to all those in Rome who are worthy of God's love. You got it? Now there's a little bit of a gem right at the beginning of the book of Romans. To all you guys in Clay's community church, all those people who are watching and see this message on YouTube and Facebook, okay, you're worthy of God's love. Stop. Let it sink in. I don't feel loved. I feel terrible. I've had a rubbish week. You're worthy of God's love. It's amazing. We could just stop the message there and just soak that in for the next three hours. No, I'm joking. But you could, couldn't you? Just stop and think about the words and what Paul is saying here. It's because you are loved. And what's more, you're made worthy of God's love. So when everything that falls away in life, you are loved. The wording of Paul is extremely interesting. Paul is talking mostly to Gentile Christians. But the phrasing of his word invokes the Old Testament and God's language about Israel. Paul is implying that as Gentile Christians, they have inherited the privileges and promises granted to the Old uh, Testament people of God. In Hosea chapter 2, he uses the words from that particular verse. Verse 23, I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. So not Israel. Not my loved one. I will say to those uh, called, not my people, the Gentiles, those whom he will be accepted, yeah, into the kingdom of God. Not my people. Not those people. I will say of them, okay, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. So Paul here, what he's doing is he's using a phrase from the Old Testament, the ones that the Jews would have known, any Jewish ones amongst them would have known and understand where he is coming from. And he's applying this to the non-Christian, or the now, not non-Christian, but the now Christian Gentiles, yeah? Yeah. So the Greeks, and some of the versions you will read will say uh, the Jews and Greeks. It doesn't really matter. We're talking about people who are not Christian, or rather not Jews, who have become Christian. He's now saying, you guys are loved by God as much as those 
in the Old Testament Israel. And he's trying to draw that parallel. Does that make sense, church? Okay. Right. So putting it simply, he's saying, you're in the family. Now, a couple of years ago, my eldest daughter got married. And uh, she got married to a guy called Tom. You probably, most of you have met him. He's a lovely guy. And it's like Tom, okay, is not part of the family, but he's been brought into the family. He's like one of us. In fact, when Tom comes down, we just treat him like one of the family. Do the dishes, do the hoof. No, we don't. <laughs> but Tom is just like one of us now. He wasn't in the family. He now is. You and I weren't in the family, but now, like those Gentiles, we are now in the family because of the love of Christ. Are you with me? Somebody say amen, because that is good news. That is really good news tonight, church. All right. So, where are we? Here's a question. Are you worthy of God's love? I'm going to ponder that one for a second. Let it sink in. Are you worthy of God's love? Okay, rhetorical question. Work it out for yourself. Because there will be two schools of thought in here tonight. I guarantee it. All right? The first, okay, um, well, actually, the second school of thought, let's go to that one first, okay, will be, no, I'm not worthy of God's love. Some of you guys in here are saying, I'm not worthy of God's love. Yeah? Some of you are thinking, who am I? Why me? How can you say that God loves me? Some of you are thinking that. Some of you might even have thought that this week. Anybody? Over the last month, I'm not really worthy of God's love. And some of you maybe don't feel worthy because you feel dirty, unclean, undeserved, or whatever it may, 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 may well be. Perhaps because if you look at our own sinfulness against God's, God's perfection, we can say that we just don't measure up to God's love. And in a sense, that would be true. But Paul's not saying that. 1 John chapter 2 says this, My dear children, I write this to you that so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. And not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. It is by the blood of Jesus Christ and the ultimate sacrifice on the cross that makes you worthy of God's love. Are you with me? All right. So the second possibility, or the first one, because I went in reverse order, is that some of you are absolutely sure that you are worthy of God's love because you know that God loves you. I want to suggest that the answer to this question, in my opinion, is this one. All right? That we are all worthy of God's love because he has made us worthy. But is there any evidence for this? Well, twofold. Yes, there is. Number one, the obvious one. Before sin was even an issue, God loved the world. Yeah? Before sin, before you even messed up this week, before even Adam and Eve messed up in the world, God loved his world. So that's the first piece of evidence. The second one is this, that you and I are pre-planned, pre-thought out. You are pre-ordained in his creation. Now, uh, several years ago, Lucy and I went to visit a, a church. It was just, there was nobody in it. It was just an open church. And it was a church which was an Anglican church, a very old one up in Launceston. And as you went into the church, I'm reminded of the pews. I was thinking about this when I was sort of preparing this. And in this particular church in Launceston, everything was a pew. They had no soft chairs or anything, coverings or anything. And on the end of every aisle, and I mean every aisle, there must have been about 20 deep or more, on each side of those pews, including the ones on the side, the smaller ones, one side was carved, someone had carved engravings of portions of the Bible, Adam and Eve, Eden, the vine and the branches and so forth. And it was incredible. I love things like that. I love 
the artistry. I love the love that has gone into something like that. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily function well today in today's society. But I could, I, I stood there thinking, wow, someone has individually carved out every one of those pews. Do you know what I thought about you and I? God has individually carved out you and I for his purposes. And there is no two pews the same. But the carpenter loves each one. Amen? All right, okay. So, here's the thing about it. The carpenter we choose, maybe that brand new piece of wood, okay, and then we build in all those dovetail joints and whatever he would use, okay, and there would be no hammer or nails, okay, be all lovingly put together, tongue and groove or whatever it is, and he puts it together and he begins to carve out all those designs with the chisels and, and the hammer and just the mallet and just puts things together. And for centuries in those churches, even in here, people will come and they will go, and in this day in 21st century, all right, Things have changed, haven't they? And of course, the original purpose is forgotten and neglected. And here's the problem with sinful mankind. Is that, for example, okay, in today's, in today's church, we often, okay, you have children maybe running about, and maybe they're hiding under the pews, and the original meaning, the original design has been forgotten, because it's just some place to hide, some place to, you know, calm. And over the centuries, woodworm gets in. Do you see the analogy come in church? Can you? Isn't that better like our lives? And I wonder, as God sits there, as it were, and looks at his creation, whom he's created individually, and he sees the neglect over mankind. He sees the neglect as a result of sin, as a result of torture, as a result of pain, as a result of abuse, as a result of stealing, as a result of theft, as a result of, of going our own way. And of course we see this contrast between, between the creator carpenter and what is now left later on. Does that mean that the carpenter, although he may well be disappointed, doesn't love his creation? Of course not. God still loves you and I. Are you with me? All right, okay. Here's the miracle though. God in his grace and mercy is able to see a way through all of that because you and I are his creation. That's how God sees and feels about you. Our second part of the evidence I was going to say there is John 3.16. So before creation, before sin entered the world, God loves you. But John 3.16, you all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So Jesus Christ gave his life as a ransom on a cross as an act of God's infinite love. Okay? What does God's love mean for us? There's a question, church, okay? What does God's love mean for us tonight? So often in church, we focus on the now love and simply how valuable we are. There is nothing wrong with that, church. There is nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing. It's really important that we actually explain, you know, how valuable we are. But the downside is that it makes it all about us if that's all we preach on. If that's all we talk about in church is how valuable you are, we forget the bigger picture. Okay, why is that? How many times does someone say to you, or you've heard the phrase, I love you? Think about it. And then three weeks later, okay, we think, oh, does that person really love me? That person, do they, do they really care about me? Yeah? You know what I'm talking about? See, the problem is that we can be so focused on the love about ourselves that we forget about the love of the Saviour. All right? So, here we go. We're just going to dive into this a bit longer. Because I could preach that kind of sermon, and I've got no problem preaching that kind of message. 
But I want us to understand that we need to get to the point where we just simply go from the motions to motions to motions about, well, do I feel loved? Does God really love me? How can I know that God loves me? God loves you. And of course, that's the fact that we need to get into our heads. Isn't it? The work of the cross should be enough. But for some reason in our humanity, in our thinking, and hear me right, it kind of isn't because we keep on going back to the past and that's the nature of the devil. That's the nature of sin. We need to get to grips with the love of God for our lives so that we don't keep on allowing the enemy to distract us from the mission that God has called us to because we don't feel like it. We're going to come to that. Okay. So, it's because the reason why we, we don't feel loved a short time later, for two reasons. Number one, it's either that we are needs focused, very needy, or we are feelings focused. Oh no, my, my life's falling apart. Okay, and sometimes it does. Okay, but you know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm over exaggerating, okay, a little bit on this. All right. Feelings are the result of being loved, but love just is. Okay? Turn to your neighbor and just say, love just is. Okay, just shout out to somebody, Rachel. Okay, I saw you. Oh, I'm going over there. Love just is. All right, here we go. Whether we feel like it or not, in order to answer the question of love, we have to define and consider the origin of love. The Bible makes it clear that God is love. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's even better, because God is love. Okay, so now you can say love just is. God is love. All right, so that's 1 John 4, 8. He isn't just loving, he is the very definition of love. He loves us because he created us. His affection is unconditional. He both generates and demonstrates love. On top of this, his love is infinite. Psalm 100 verse 5 says this. His love was forever, endures forever. God is love. All right. So the problem with having conditional love is that it takes the focus off God. So when we don't feel love. When all is going wrong and God, do you really love me this week as opposed to last week? Didn't we have a great time in church and I felt the love of God and this week I just don't feel your love? That's conditional love, isn't it? Yeah? So, the problem with having conditional love is that it takes the focus off God, it places it on us and fundamentally what we end up with is an acceptance issue. Isn't it? Do you accept me, God, for who I am? I don't feel your love. That's where we end up in our lives. It's an acceptance issue. And we feel all insecure because of it. So what we need to do is we need to get to a place of this, do you, do you, do you really love me, God? This acceptance issue to knowing that God loves me. Yeah? That's where we need to get to. All right. So we're going to look at four or five proofs, I think it is, okay, of, you know, God's love, okay? We need to get to that. Once we accept his love unconditionally, we can begin to accept ourselves for who he sees us as. Does that make sense? Once we understand and we accept that love, then we don't have to keep on doing this fighting, you know what? Sometimes I have a pretty rubbish week. I really do. And there's been a time quite recently when I've come back and I've said, God, you know what? I just feel really rubbish. I, feel, I just feel trashed. I just feel, God, it's just God. But I, I, I got to a point where I just prayed and I said, God, you still love me. No matter what. No matter what, you still love me. Because there comes a point when you just have to accept God's love. Kind of get over it. Yeah? In a way. All right. So the first proof of God's love is this. God is always present. All right? 
God is always present. There can be many reasons why we struggle with God's love. Here are a couple. Number one, someone's let us down. So our expectations of God are a reflection of our relationships with others. Secondly, we struggle with his love because we don't love ourselves. That's exactly what we were just saying a minute ago. Okay, we look to ourselves for acceptance and then we accept God? No. We accept God's love and then because of that, we see that he loves us no matter how we feel, so we accept ourselves. That's where we need to come to. The third one is this. Sometimes, and this is just three out of many, Thirdly, with regards to his presence, we can often just feel downright lonely. But God, what he's done is he's put into place this magnificent organization called the church. Where we don't have to feel lonely. The Bible says this, that God places the lonely where? In families. So if you're sitting on the outside looking inside, wish I was on the inside, but I'm outside, then get inside. Because you're in the family already. I think we explored this last week a little bit in a different form. All right, here we go. Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise in the wings of dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. You cannot get away from God because he's always present. You need to accept that. We need to accept that. If God is love, then it stands to reason that where his presence goes, so does his love, because he is love. Yes? It's all good news, all right? I've been waiting for a while to preach a message on love. But it needs to come from God's heart. Yeah? All right. Number two, the second proof is this. second proof of God's love is God is just. The one thing I've learned about children is they expect fairness, okay? We see it in our house probably more than most, all right? And it's really, really hard. Well, why can't I go to bed at your nine o'clock? Because your sister is like 10 years older than you. That's why you can't go to bed at nine o'clock, yeah? That thing. You're, you're like five years old, yeah? So children expect fairness. They don't like injustice. If one gets chocolate, the other one wants chocolate, don't they? If one gets told off, they expect the other one will get told off when they get it wrong. We all have an innate sense of justice and get angry against injustice. Isn't that true? How about the post office scandal right at this moment? And people getting upset about this. They've now got all the media involved in this. How about that? How about cash for favours? People don't like the fact that other people get this. I remember, okay, uh, recently, when I say recently, there was people doing extensions and, and extending the, their piece of ground around St. Evel. And all of a sudden, there was things going on, on Facebook saying, well, if they're going to do that, I'm going to report it. But the next thing is, they're doing the same thing. Extending the land because people want the same as other people. People think it's unfair that they've got something, but we haven't got it. Not true. Yeah. And so some people will get caught lying, uh, grand, uh, grabbing lands. And, and then what they'll say is they won't turn around and say, Well, I'm really sorry about that. What they'll say is everybody else is doing it. It's true. And so we've seen that. I believe that justice is a God quality. Do you believe that? Justice is a God, a God quality. And it comes from having a just God. In fact, at the very heart of God's character and love for you is justice. In fact, take it one step further, justification. Just as if I'd never sinned. Yes, we have sinned. Yes, we don't deserve heaven. But because of justification, because God, God has made us just, 
and he has brought about his goodness and his perfect love into our lives, it has made such a difference that we have been made worthy of his justice and his love and his goodness and his grace. We sung it tonight. It's a good, good father. It's who he is. It's a declaration of who the father is. Moving on. All right. So God takes injustice very seriously. And if you've been mistreated, then the proof of God's love for you is found in the words of Jesus. Luke 11 says this, Woe to you Pharisees because you give a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Because God is just, the Bible insists that his children should strive to make right that which is wrong. Isaiah 1 says this, Learn to do what's right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. So God loves you because he treats everyone the same. It's a proof of his love that he bestows justice to everyone. And even if it doesn't happen in this lifetime, church, be assured that God will stand up for you in the day of judgment. Amen? So we need to understand that a proof of God's love is he is just. All right. Number three, the third proof of God's love is this. God is faithful. At the heart of all God's actions are his, in, his world, uh, in our world is his faithfulness. This means he keeps his promises. His faithfulness is never temporary. As we looked at love, it endures forever through all generations. Psalm 119 verse 90, if you're writing down. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. People let us down all the time. Have you ever noticed that? You ever been let down? Yeah? Sometimes it's meaning. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes people do it on purpose. Sometimes they don't. We, 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 Lucy and I, we went to college with a guy. And he would say, I'll be around at 7 o'clock at night and he would turn up at 11. And you're like, I'm going to bed. <laughs> I'm done. I've had enough. I'm getting up to preach tomorrow morning. And he would let you down all the time. But he would never turn up all the time. Yeah, yeah, for days on end. And it was really, really hard work. And of course, it is a character flaw when you get someone like that. So we need to be true to our word, don't we? Yeah? That's something, it's a God quality that should be within us. Every one of us, though, have our character flaws. But unreliability can be frustrating. This is because in order to make some things happen in life, we need other people. Yeah? You need me, I need you. You need each other. I am really going to turn that off in a second. Okay? We all need each other. And of course, we need to be faithful in how we approach our relationships to one another. But that's another thing altogether. But remember that people will let us down, but God doesn't. It's an act of his love. Have you ever felt like that? If someone promises you the earth, but you, they let you down and you lose trust in them. Faithfulness is all about promises made and promises delivered. God's faithfulness extends beyond all earth, earthly transactions. It also applies to eternal hope and the promise of the coming kingdom. So it's here on earth, God's kingdom, God's promises, but it's also the promise of heaven. All right? So where are we? We may live in an unreliable and untrustworthy world, church, okay? But we serve a faithful God who keeps his word. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, if you're taking notes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen or amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. So when God says it, what's your reply? Amen. amen. And so it shall be. It's in faith. But it's an act. It's a proof of God's love. Number four. 
God is good. We sung it. Luke 18, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. The fact that God is good means that there is no evil in him. His intentions and his motivations are always good. He always does what is right. And the outcome of his plan is always good. There is nothing unpleasant, evil or dark in God. In fact, God is the standard and example of all good. Psalm 119 verse 68 says this, You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. So in other words, if you want to understand what goodness is, then allow God to teach you, because that's the trust basis that we have with God, isn't it? That God would teach us about his goodness. And of course, when we begin to see that God is good, that God is always there, he's reliable, we understand that he loves us, that he's got our best intentions at heart, hasn't he? All right, you keeping up, church? Yeah? Everyone say aye or nay. Okay? All right, where are we? Psalm 34. If you're not sure about that, then here's how you do it. Here's the application to that. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. You see, if you want to understand the goodness of God and you don't trust him, then you need to taste the goodness of God. Now, if you want to go away and look into that, that may be a bit of homework for this week. All right? Because that will take too long to go into. But it's good that we go and further our knowledge and understanding of the the Word of God. God's goodness extends to his provision, his security, his comfort, his direction, his kindness and compassion. Why not go away, think about it, study Psalm 34, get into it and read it and understand how good God is. Understand what it means to taste and see the goodness of God's love. The fifth proof is this, that God is sovereign. To say that God is sovereign can make us think, well, how does that teach me that God loves me? Surely it's the exact opposite. Surely God is distant out there. Surely God is far away. Surely God is outside of this world and outside of my experience. How can God understand apart from through the cross? Yeah, my life. How can God? God is so far away. God is immeasurable. God is this. God is that. And of course we can think, well, God is sovereign, okay? But You see, it's a big word, but the idea behind it is that God is in control and that nothing in our lives happens without his knowledge or permission. That's how we know the goodness of God and his love in our lives. It's because everything that you are, everything that you think, everything that you feel, God knows it all because he's sovereign. And yet he still loves you. And yet he would have still sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you. That's how we know. It's good news. Yeah? Okay, where are we? It's the fact that God is in a position to see all our lives and therefore is in a position to bring about the best possible outcome for our lives. Jeremiah 10, 23, for your note takers, Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It's not for them to direct their steps. Why? Because God sees the bigger picture for your life and mine. And finally, the sixth proof is this. God's unfailing love. It's hard for most adults to wrap their minds around God's attributes, let alone children. In fact, I think children do it so much easier. And teaching concepts like God's sovereignty and benevolence to children, that can be challenging in any setting. But these elements of his character don't just help us to know him better, church. They help us to achieve our full potential in him. When we think about love, and as we serve a God whose love is unfailing, we remember that God, or who God is, informs everything that we do as believers. And in our ministry, okay, whatever God does, God, God has 
our best interests at heart. We've said this. We need to keep on saying this. We need to get this into our heads and into our hearts that God's love is unfailing. It didn't just stop on the day of Calvary when Jesus Christ died for you and I. It is eternal, all right? And it is huge, okay? Back as children, God's love is so high you can't get over it, so low you can't get under it, so wide you can't get around it. Do you remember? We all sung it as children. But Romans 8 just sums it up, doesn't it? Come on. It's one of my favourites. It's right up there for God's love. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, come on, rhyme it off, neither angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor any powers nor any height nor depth nor anything else in all creation can what? Separate us from what? The love of God. Woo! Now you lot should be buzzing when you go out here tonight. All right, you should be dancing down the street. All right, you should be singing hallelujah. Okay, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Or whatever you want to sing, from whatever era you want to sing. But you cannot get away from the love of God. No matter what you think, say, feel, do, or whatever. Amen? Amen. And so we come to a conclusion, a really simple one. I read it earlier, earlier on. All right. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. When we get this right, this goes right. This goes right. Doesn't it? See, let's get away from the focusing on, you know, how valuable I am. You are valuable but you will never understand the value of who you are until you understand what the cross is all about and the love of God for your life. Unless you get that into your heart, you will never understand fully. And I don't even think I'll ever understand this side of heaven fully. But I'm talking about this insecurity stuff, this acceptance thing. Are you with me, church? We need to get this right. How God loves me. Why God loves me. God does love me. And that sorts out the insecurity, the acceptance issue in my heart. That's why I preached it that way about. Not that God doesn't love you. He does. There's time for the touchy-feely sermon. But we need to know the value that God places upon us. Yeah? Yeah?